Hello. Today I'd like to take a look at a topic sometimes covered under the idea of the so-called narcissist, of why some people, perhaps many of us, idealize someone. In other words, start off thinking someone is perfect or hoping, and then later when we find some flaw in the person, discard them. Why would we idealize people so much to begin with and then discard them, so to speak? Well, this is simply my own personal view. Some psychologists or psychiatrists might have a much different view, perhaps. but. I'm going to expound upon this a little bit and see whether some other people might uh, think it's worthy of consideration too. I would say, first of all, that perhaps a major reason to idealize in the first place comes from our childhoods. I'm reminded of a psychoanalyst, for instance, once in Europe, whose name escapes me, but I did read her book three or four years ago entitled Thou Shalt Not Be Aware. Thou Shalt Not Be Aware. In other words, from her point of view of various forms of trauma or lack of love given or shown to certain children, thou shalt not be aware of what's happening to you in general. Or, to put it another way, when a child who is not treated so well or doesn't receive the love that they ideally uh, could have is often encouraged by the parent or parents to think that the parenting is good and that the parents are highly loving Thus, again, falling under the idea of the book, thou shalt not be aware of how you're really being raised, but instead uh, being encouraged highly, if you will, to idealize the parent. Now, I would say that this can also play out in another big way that I've seen since reading this book, and that is the idealizing of someone to find what you might call the perfect person to take care of us if we feel helpless to get our basic needs met and basically be happy enough in life. We might thus start off with an unrealistic desire unrealistic goals in life for someone to be not only our kindred spirit to believe exactly what we believe but also to be the perfect helper, the perfect caretaker, the perfect parent, the perfect protector in a world that is arguably challenging at a minimum to put it lightly now, psychology and its diagnostic criteria would say that one of the biggest and most common personality disorders, as they put it, is dependency personality disorder, and that this is more commonly found in women, perhaps, than men. And so, I would kind of uh, posit that perhaps this idea of many of us seeking a protector in a world that is not exactly uh, the most supportive, to put it mildly, uh, can make us dependent under certain circumstances and thus uh, orient us toward wanting a protector and the next issue then being what kind of a protector? Well, one that's pretty Pretty, uh, 
protective, I would say, to put it humorously, as strong a protector as possible. Either a deity, basically, what we might call God or higher power, or the perfect person, a person we conjure up as ideal, in other words, and thus having what you might call an idealizing orientation toward everyone, at the beginning at least, in very hopeful fashion of finding that one person we can depend upon. Emphasis then on dependency disorder to protect us from any eventualities that might pop up that we'd find highly distressing, of course. Now, things that we might want to feel protected by or from could, in my opinion, include protection from physical injury. We might particularly like protection if we had physical injuries in childhood, either from a parent in terms of violence, physically or sexually, or from bullying, perhaps. Uh, not to mention, of course, environments uh, so stressful in general today in urban environments, um, and in some environments, uh, country living might not be uh, immune from such challenges either. But yet another issue, I would say totally unrelated to issues of wanting to feel protected from violence of various forms, would be wanting to be able to make it in the world, which is these days highly competitive, and we're more and more forced to be independent all the time with uh, family structures uh, disintegrating more and more and religion going by the wayside more and more. I would say that um, we can find ourselves very challenged uh, if we can't come up with solutions in our minds through thinking well to meet life's challenges today under very competitive circumstances. Now, what would make for some people having such a very hard time using their minds to cope with life's challenges and make their way well in the world, or adequately at least? Well, based on my own personal experiences and reading and thinking, I would kind of throw this out for consideration. There's talk today by some people of the concept of limiting beliefs that many or most of us have that then highly uh, put a cap, if you will, on our progress and potential that we would otherwise be able to reach. Now, I would say for some, it would then not be just a matter of not reaching your potential, but even survival. What if so many of us have what is called a limiting belief or more that makes it very difficult to even survive, and, and thus we would turn <clears throat> to being dependent, if you will, on others, do our thinking for us, whether about how to approach a problem, how to plan, or just daily maintenance even. Now in the past, psychiatry, I believe, called such things delusions, that the kind non-toxic word in my mind would be limiting beliefs. But the older generation word, more clinical word, would be delusions. Fixed beliefs that are largely unchangeable over time. At least in the past, with less precise thinking and a lot of political correctness on the scene. Indeed, the very idea and notion of a delusion, as talked about in the past, was generally subscribed to or put into the rubric of schizophrenia, whereby if one had a delusion, one could be called schizophrenic. 
and furthermore that these delusions were claimed to be almost entirely due to genetic causes. But in my opinion, many, many so-called delusions, or in today's parlance perhaps, limiting beliefs, are inherited, yes, but not genetically, but what you might call from social memes, M-E-M-E-S, or, in general, a particular outlook that your family might have had, your parents, that could be passed on from generation to generation. What if, for instance, your parent had a viewpoint on something called today a very dysfunctional or a limiting belief, or in the past a delusion? This then would be taught to the child naturally as part of their training as how to live life and arguably thus be the transmission of a delusion through verbal means, not genetic means, as per some uh, lesion on the brain or something. This is very rarely discussed in psychiatry, but in my opinion, is uh, the leading reason for what you would call delusions, that it has almost no basis biologically, but instead uh, is something passed down from a parent's particular dysfunctional viewpoint, or a commonly held mass delusion, if you will, in society at that point in time. To include even as possible delusions about what makes you most happy in life, whether it's a spiritual approach, a thinking approach, or a money approach. Each country being different in its uh, favored approach and thus uh, its favored delusion of choice if a delusion or limiting belief is involved. At any rate, at this point in time, the topic and title of a book comes to mind, written by Napoleon Hill way back, Think and Grow Rich. Well, I would say, in my opinion, then, riches not necessarily meaning monetarily, but perhaps emotionally or spiritually. And that the bottom line would be that thinking could bring this about success, happiness, riches, in whatever fashion you define it and pursue it to be. But then, of course, there's the rub, isn't there? That we're not just talking thinking as per applying critical thinking and good logic, but addressing your premises, too, or what you might have called in the past your delusions you may have uh, had inculcated into you, or in modern parlance, your limiting beliefs. Now, to tie this into another topic, I would say an additional factor in some people turning to heavy dependence on others to do their thinking and general orientation of everything in their lives has to do with how well they learn from experience, or, as you will, learning from your mistakes. For it occurred to me several months ago that I and many other people tend in life to have made the same few mistakes over and over again, or whatever mistakes we make, going back in origin to a few incorrect premises that generate a plethora of mistakes down the line. And that while we can say we should learn from our mistakes, that it's rather futile in large part to try and correct individual mistakes if you don't get to the root of the problem, often the root being an incorrect premise or two, or in other words, a limiting belief, an incorrect premise, an incorrect idea about reality 
that was once called a delusion, in fact. But the point being that I think most people would agree that if we can't so-called learn from our mistakes, then we will repeat them over and over. And those who make mistakes repeatedly will in time consider themselves a failure at life, I think, and give up and develop what some would call learned helplessness. We would feel we're helpless against the challenges of life. And then when we look at some we consider more successful either in a marriage or relationship uh, capacities or monetary standards, job standards, where we live and so on, we might just say to ourselves, I'm incompetent to live. I can't seem to get it right. I keep making mistakes. I keep failing. And I can't figure out why. With the bottom line then being turning over our thinking to someone else who seems more successful at it. Perhaps sometimes they are. Depending, of course, how you measure success. That's a very biggie, of course, in my opinion nowadays. Now, there are some who I've viewed, for instance, on YouTube shows who say that success is almost guaranteed to the person who never quits, but that, unfortunately, it being said that most people quit or quit too soon. It's been said, too, for instance, that many people quit on running a blog, for instance, because they think they're not getting much traffic on the blog, and it's said that sometimes they quit too soon. Well, I kind of see a lot of merit in this urging people not to quit, because my latest thinking is that if you hang in there long enough and keep making the same mistakes over and over, basically, as per your premises staying the same, that eventually, somehow, hopefully, in time, it may take a long time, that you'll start to examine something very painful, and that is what premises we grew up with, what limiting beliefs or delusions, if you will, we grew up with and never faced because it was so painful. And if only we don't quit, we keep trying and keep failing, that we may incrementally start chipping away at those premises, those limiting beliefs that cause so much failure, repeated failure, and in turn are declaring ourselves incompetent to live life and becoming dependent on others, feeling a sense of learned helplessness and dependency on others for running our lives and telling us how to think, what yardsticks to use for happiness, and so on, how to measure happiness, what to pursue, and so on, with the result that too many people then turn to their guru of choice, as I put it, whether a talk show host, Oprah once having been very popular, or late night television shows, comedian shows, or perhaps a favorite religion. Not to bash religions, of course, but um, again, some being perhaps more enlightened than others, in my own opinion, depending again how one was raised and what uh, limiting beliefs, if you will, were uh, brought to your uh, attention, so to speak, as a child growing up. Others of us may have a favorite author or a favorite blog or a favorite podcast or number of podcasts we listen to, all of which, in many cases, we may deem very important to us because we may, some of us, think we're rather incompetent to get our basic human needs met consistently and sufficiently to be sufficiently happy enough in life. So we turn 
all too often to our guru of choice. I'm reminded, for instance, of what a therapist told me when I was in my 20s. He recommended a book to me. And, of course, in bright fashion, I didn't read it, but I do remember the title. If you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. I can only speculate, but the book may have partly been about the phenomenon of pursuing gurus or being dependent on others for our thinking. Or the bottom line being idealizing people in the hope that they can be our protector and help us navigate life when we think we're incompetent to do so and frankly sometimes that being the case rather sadly to say but optimistically not necessarily for life depending on whether we quit or whether we keep trying and keep trying and keep trying I'd close this with a tangential idea on why some of us idealize and then discard. We may discard largely because we find a flaw in a guru, so to speak, or an intellectual podcaster, what have you, that signals to us they are not going to be powerful enough to do the protecting we want and crave to the sufficient level of quality and consistency and capacity. But another factor being how we measure these um, gurus for I would say, from observation, many of us have preconceived notions of what the optimal guru would be like. That uh, we have our sort of limiting beliefs sometimes as to the best guru and the, the least competent guru to pursue. And so, for instance, we may idealize someone to do our thinking for us or to protect us physically only to discard them when we deem the person to have a facet we didn't originally see that was hidden under the covers so to speak and that only getting to know the person better would reveal I'm thinking for instance that when two people get married Sometimes they may have differences in religious views. Those views may be small or large. Two people, for instance, may both claim to be Christians, but as time goes on, they may discover that one is either much more sincere or much more committed in a certain direction than the other. And then the issue being whether one partner deems the other partner a sufficient person to depend on to provide protection basically based on new information if you will about that person and their seeming competency to be a guru for you now idealize I mean ideally in a marriage there would be compromise and acceptance of differences. But unfortunately, for some, perhaps, the discovery of a flaw in a partner can spell that that partner cannot be an adequate protector, an adequate thinker for the other partner. And so that's where a lot of trouble may begin, right there. And then, as time goes on too in a marriage, say, or other relationship, one may discover uh, other factors that we once didn't see and only time would uncover. 
such as differences in orientation about money and the partners. Uh, orientation on money to solve problems as opposed to turning to inner means or spiritual means. And then too there may be discoveries concerning both partners orientation on sexual life. Originally at marriage at the beginning there may be an idealization but as time goes on, one partner may find themselves gravitating to much less or much more interest in sex than the other partner. And thus, the one partner, if seeking a perfect protector in every way, deeming that person no longer perfect, in this avenue alone, not to mention a very significant Avenue, of course, and there being a desire to discard this person, at least on an emotional level, if not discarding the whole marriage in general. So, thinking back on what I've been talking about, I might recap this as follows that some people, a considerable number, in fact, uh, in my opinion, tend to want to idealize people in search of a protector. A protector that must theoretically be perfect to handle some of life that is very daunting and needs uh, very good protecting against, very good thinking, or even uh, in caveman days, good protecting physically at least. And then the second half being that perhaps many of us, if not afraid of physical violence and a desire for protection from that, a desire for protection from a very competitive and often hostile world, if we can't adequately process it and think in general, because we have some kind of limiting belief that holds us back from dealing with life's challenges efficiently and correctly, uh, if you could put it that way, in a general sense. And so, if we can't process reality well from some limiting belief, not at all really associated with IQ or logic skills, that this can render us almost incompetent to live life and we will then seek a protector to protect us from our incompetency to meet life's challenges. So either way, the seeking of a protector and if we discover someone we had high hopes of filling this uh, role for is less than perfect and adequate we would discard them and move on in hopes of uh, greener grass somewhere else soon discovered, only to be repeated over and over. As one person told me, a therapist, the Seinfeld effect. I'd have to delve into that concept, but anyway, that uh, phrase stuck out in my mind that there was a Seinfeld show or more than one dealing with this topic in some fashion. Now, of course, there's no easy answers in life, but I would go back to what I was talking about a little earlier and um, think that what has helped me so much in my personal growth is not to quit in life. And that through extended periods of what you might call beating your head against a brick wall, that in time, what was once, what was once so challenging, especially due to fears of violence perhaps, and 
incompetent thinking from bad premises developed from childhood and society's programming, if you will, can be altered inch by inch. I'm reminded humorously of the phrase that I'll put out here in closing. Inch by inch, life's a cinch, but yard by yard, life is hard. Of course, that's so trivial to say in a certain respect, especially if we're not even progressing inch by inch per day, but a millimeter by millimeter, very, very tiny fraction of an inch per day. But the point being that I think personally at age 60 now that if we keep beating our heads against that brick wall, eventually we're going to learn a thing or two about something holding us back that causes us to make so many mistakes and often the same ones or the same groupings over and over again. And that once you overcome these limiting beliefs, if you will, to some extent, the better, hopefully the better, the more the better, that um, we can come to grow in what you might call success in life. Happiness in terms of getting our basic human needs met at a minimum. And then, of course, the icing on the cake being, in my opinion, to be able to help others uh, be happier, to grow more, too. Not only our loved ones, but those in our community and world, perhaps. I hope this is helpful. These topics in this audio have been very painful in my personal life to work on. I hope it's good food for thought, and I wish you well.